Well, as I was saying, it, it's a privilege to be here at the conference. I look forward to it this week. And um, it's a great pleasure to be with you, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And lecture is probably too grand a word for what I have in mind this, this morning. Uh, these really are reflections. Um, what I want to say and set before you are reflections over the course of 40 years. I've been in the ministry for 40 years now. And um, what I have to present to you are reflections that might be, I hope, particularly useful to younger men considering the ministry and entering ministry and early in ministry. I hope it's also helpful. I see a number of ladies with us, and I hope it's of some benefit to you as well. What I want to do then is to set before you ten sections uh, of information, and after each section, we'll have opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, you can provide the questions, and I'll try my best to offer some answers. It's probably be uh, more beneficial if you will ask questions that can prime the pump, as it were. So I encourage you, if you have any questions, uh, after each section there will be an opportunity to, uh, to ask some questions, so please do that. And then uh, we'll have opportunity then finally at the end as well. So let me begin with two introductory statements and uh, then we'll get to each individual section. And the first thing is, uh, don't underestimate what God can do. Don't underestimate what God can do through someone like yourself. Someone very close to me many, many years ago when I was just starting out said to me, uh, you're more a follower than a leader. And um, I think that observation was born of some very evident character flaws and traits in me. And nonetheless, I've been a pastor for 40 years, and I hope that in some ways God has used me. So never underestimate what God is able to do through even someone like yourself. With all the faults and failures and character flaws that you might have, as we say in Canada, God is able to draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And so don't underestimate what the sovereign God is able to do even through a weak vessel like yourself. The second thing is this. How do you know that you're called to the ministry? Now we're talking uh, not about ministry in general because all Christians are called to minister. If you're a young lady then, and you're a, you're a Christian, God has called you to minister. He's not called you to be a pastor. He's not called you to be an elder. But the fact of the matter is, all Christians are called to serve. And you're duty-bound as a Christian to serve. But we're thinking here particularly about the Christian ministry. We're talking about the pastorate. We're talking about a preacher of the gospel. And uh, the fact of the matter is, then, uh, that's something that God calls men to do. So how does that man know that he is called to serve Christ in that way? Well, that's a very important question. The answer can come by way of a process. It's not always evident immediately. In my case, for instance, it took a long while before I was sure that this is what I was to do. So if you're a young man and and you're still grappling with this, then understand that sometimes it takes a while. And um, even though it takes a while, in every case there needs to be two things. There needs to be what we call an internal call and an external call. So there needs to be an inner compulsion, an inner longing and determination and desire to serve the Lord in this way. By the same token then, the church must place its imprimatur upon you. And the church must say, yes, uh, 
this individual, we see the appropriate gifts in him. We see the, the characteristics that Paul talks about in Timothy. We see these things in him, and the church benefits through his ministry. And, and so the church responds and says, now here is a man that should pursue the ministry. And so when seminaries uh, accept a man to come and study, they should do so in part on the basis of recommendation from the local church. And so there need to be those two things. How do you know that you're called to the ministry? Well, an internal and an external call. And you need to be open to see what God has for you. So those two introductory comments. But now uh, let's begin by looking at the first section, the first piece of advice given to uh, young men in the ministry. And the first thing I would say is this, be yourself. Be yourself. Now, when I mean, what I mean by be yourself, things like this. Recognize your own limitations. Recognize your own limitations. When I was very young in the ministry, I realized that I was not going to be Benjamin Warfield. Dr. Benjamin Warfield, the great Presbyterian uh, Princeton theologian, was one of my heroes at the time. And it, I was sitting reading his books, and it dawned on me, I'm never going to know as much. I'm never going to be as smart as he was. I'm never going to be able to write like he did. And it was actually a wonderfully liberating thing to know that all I was called to do was to use whatever abilities God gave me for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was not called to be someone else. So know your own limitations. Know that you're never going to be Dr. Warfield. You're never going to be Spurgeon. And you're never going to be John MacArthur. So recognize your own limitations. Secondly, recognize that God will probably call you to a fairly small sphere of influence. Most pastors serve in very small ministries. Most serve in fair, fairly obscure contexts. Most of us will serve in a small pond. It will be fish in a small pond. There are men in the providence of God, and God gives them great gifts, and God gives them great platforms on which to minister. You know their names, men like Steve Lawson and, uh, well, Jeremy Walker, and men like uh, Dr. MacArthur and Dr. Sproul, uh, Alistair Begg, people like that. And God gives them tremendous opportunities and tremendous privileges in terms of a, a large and influential platform. But for most of us, that's not going to be the case. Most of us are going to have small ministries, and we need to be content with that. One of the dangers of knowing about large ministries is that we become envious. We'll talk about that more later. But recognize then that God will probably call you to a fairly small sphere of influence. That being the case, it doesn't mean that you're unimportant. It doesn't mean that you're trash. There's a wonderful poem. Um, it's called um, An Elegy Written in a, ch a Country Church Yard by a man named Thomas Gray. And there's a line in it. There are a few lines that are, are a great encouragement to any pastor who labors in obscurity. Here are the lines. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Now my point is this, that you may serve in a very small church in a very remote region of the country and nobody knows about you and your name is never in lights, but there you're serving God, and there you're useful for the building of the church, that particular local church, and there you're useful for the saving of souls who are going to live forever in the presence of God. And though nobody shouts your name abroad, and they don't put your name in lights all over the country, but there you're honoring God. It's not an insignificant thing then, to serve God in a small place and in, a, in an obscure church. 
And so remember that God will probably call you to a small sphere, sphere of influence, but that's okay. And that's what's going to be true of most of us. It's only the few who have large influence. Most Christian pastors small, serve in these kinds of small settings. This is part of what it means to just be yourself. Be what God has called you to do. It also means that you recognize that your ministry is your ministry. It's not the ministry of someone else. Your ministry is your ministry. It's not the ministry of someone else. And so you're not going to learn about what Mark Dever is doing in Washington and try and replicate that in Manila. Now, these other men have their opportunities and their contacts. Now, we serve in our context. And so in my case, I serve in a Canadian culture. It's quite different from American. And so we serve with that kind of understanding. You are different from your brother down the road, and so you bring different gifts to the, the ministry. And so again, you serve with that recognition that this is, is your ministry. It's not the ministry of someone else down the road, and so you're not to be imitating them. Which brings me to the next point, and that is that uh, you need to recognize that you're not to imitate others. Recognize who you are. Be yourself. Recognize who you are and don't imitate others. I find that a lot of young men these days, you know, they have sermon audio and those kinds of facilities, and they listen to 30 John Piper sermons during the course of a week. And they do that for months on end. Well, what happens? Well, they eventually begin to sound just like John Piper. And they get up and they all start to sound the same way and make the same gestures. There was a fellow in, in our area and he used, to always, he used to always do this. And then when he was going to make a point, he would do this. Well, I started to see some young men going like that, right? Well, what happens when you do that? If you're, if you're a young preacher and you're doing John Piper or you do, you're doing John MacArthur up in the pulpit, what happens? Well, you know what happens is, is what you did. You kind of giggled. You, you, you kind of laughed, right? Well, that's what people do. There was one, there's a very famous preacher um, oh, about 40 years ago now. And he came to our church. His name was Al Martin. He came to our church. And at the time, he was very, very popular. And a lot of young men in our church and in our churches began to imitate him. They learned so much. They listened to him so much. They, they began to unconsciously imitate him. And so he was at, speaking at our church. And after the service, I was standing there and Pastor Martin was standing here, and then one of the young men was standing over here talking to him. And so I'm looking this way, and all of a sudden I hear Pastor Martin talking. And he would talk like this, really deep and low and powerful. So he would talk, and all of a sudden, this young man would talk. And so first it's, well, well, and then over here it's, well, well, well. And it sounded like, it was like stereo. Well... There is a sense in which that's inevitable. If you, have, if you have heroes and if you have a pastor that you train under, it's almost inevitable that you're going to learn something from them. You're going to gain some of their, pick up some of their inflections and their tones and so forth. But when it starts to sound exactly the same, that's really a problem. So what we counsel young men to do is if, you know, if you're going to listen to other preachers, which you should, if you want to learn how to preach, you should listen to other preachers read uh, sermons, read Spurgeon, and, and listen to the, the many excellent uh, uh, preachers that we have in our day. But don't listen exclusively to one. It's far better to listen to uh, 15 sermons from 15 different pastors 
than 15 sermons from one pastor. If you're going to download sermons from Sermon Audio, uh, make sure you get a variety because you need to recognize when you're starting to imitate other men. It's a bad habit and you want to try and uh, eradicate that kind of thing from your ministry. So recognize this tendency in yourself. You need to be yourself. And then recognize who you are and, and do all you can. You don't have the gifts of other people, but you have your own gifts. You don't have their abilities, but you have what God has given you, and, and you need to do everything you can with what God has given you. My pastor, I served him as his assistant for uh, about eight or nine years, and then he died. He went home to be with the Lord, and then I took over. And for a year, I struggled with the fact that I wasn't him, and I wasn't able to do what he did. And finally, I realized I need to either get out of the ministry or just smarten up and just be myself and not try to do the kinds of things he could do because I couldn't do those. So recognize what you can do and who you are and then do it to the best of your ability. Work hard with what you have. Proverbs speaks uh, much against against laziness. And the fact that you're not as gifted as someone else doesn't give you the liberty to just be lazy. No, with whatever God has given you, you use that to the best of your ability. You do everything you can with what you have. So realize who you are and do all that you can. And, um, and then recognize who you are and, and just be that. What I mean is, when you preach, you can imitate other people. But by the same token, sometimes there are pastors who take on an air of spirituality that isn't real. I am, um, you know, they have a ministerial voice. I was at a, a conference one time and uh, a gentleman came up to, well, in a context like this, and he was going to, he was going to open in prayer. And I was sitting in the, in the congregation, and, and he talked for a few minutes, and then, and then he began to pray. And um, I bowed my head, and when he began to pray, I looked up. Because I thought that what had happened is someone had come and taken away the man who had been there, and put a different man in the place. Because he would talk like this, the way I'm talking now, and then when he prayed, he'd say, Oh, Lord, give us this day. And there was a, there was a ministerial kind of voice, a, a, a fake and a phony kind of spirituality that was put on for prayer. Well, we don't want that kind of thing. We need to be genuine and we need to be real. So recognize who you are and be yourself in the pulpit and be yourself when it comes to uh, the spirituality that you manifest in your conduct and in the pulpit as well. So that's the first thing. Any questions about this? Be yourself. Now, the second piece of advice, the second reflection, be a lifelong student. If you're a, if you're a pastor, well, you've got to be yourself. Secondly, you need to be a lifelong student. Uh, let me encourage you not to rest on your laurels intellectually. One of the dangers for us as we, well, now I'm not talking so much to young men, I'm talking about those of us like myself who are getting a little older. And one of the dangers is that you can rest on the past. You can, you can begin to coast. You know, some of these older fellows like myself, you start to move a little slower. You know, when we walk, we tend to walk a little slower. Well, the, the same thing can happen intellectually and in terms of, of effort, in terms of study. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to be, begin to coast. We don't want to drift along. 
We want to be vigorous. We want to be hardworking. We want to read and we want to think and we want to study and we want to pray for insight. We want to get wisdom. We want to grow in knowledge and understanding. There's all kinds of prayers like that in Paul's epistles as he prays for the saints, that we might grow in wisdom and in knowledge and in understanding. And that must be the case for those of us, especially those of us who are pastors, so that we might minister to the congregation and and be able to help them grow. Um, We need to be maturing in our faith, so we need to be reading. One of the problems with, with pastors is that we, you know, we can talk. You know, we have the gift of gab. Some guys can just, just talk. And, and one of the dangers then is pastors can begin to rely on that, that gift of gab, that ability to just talk. And they get up and they can just, they can just talk about spiritual things, but they, they haven't done the work. Well, you young men, make sure that you set a pattern when you're young that you're going to work hard on your sermons. You're going to study diligently. You're going to read and prepare and and do all of that prayerfully, and you keep up that habit right to the end. I've known some older men, men in their 60s and 70s and 80s, and they're still sharp as a tack, and they're still thinking, and they're still reading the latest books, and they're still aware of all the latest theological issues that are going on in the world, And, and they're still sharp in the latter days of their lives. I think it was McShane who said, let my, my latter days be my best days. That's what we want. And so we never want to, to rest on our laurels intellectually. We want to always be voracious in our appetite for knowledge and for understanding and for, for growth in terms of our grasp of the Scriptures. What this means then is to read constantly. Read con- I mean, encourage you, read constantly. I know that there are difficulties with, uh, with getting books here in the Philippines. I understand that. Um, but you know, there's so much that's available now online. Uh, I know um, some of your pastors post sometimes uh, links to mo- the monogism.com, the, the, uh, the free books that are available there. Oh, I take advantage of that. You want to read. You want to read uh, all kinds of books. Uh, read secular books. Read uh, biographies of, of uh, unbelievers. Great men and women, and some perhaps more obscure men and women. But read biographies and read books on, on astronomy, on, on history, on, uh, on different areas of science. I mean, read these books so that you broaden your knowledge. And then, of course, read all kinds of Christian books. Pastors should read all kinds of Christian books, books on theology, uh, commentaries, uh, biographies, church history, uh, books that deal with um, particular issues of the day, and and so on and so forth, and, and work their way through that. And you think that if you, once you graduate from seminary, oh, you're done the whole student work. Not at all. You've, you've just begun. And all the, the reading that you've done there, that just gets you started. You're now going to enter into a, a life of being a student, of study and of reading and of familiarizing yourself with, with as m- many areas of knowledge as you possibly can. And then read the newspapers. Read what's going on. I, people don't read newspapers. At least in Canada, they still print newspapers. I don't know how long that's going to last. But read the news online. I mean, find out what's, what's going on in your country. Find out what's going on in the world. We're supposed to be, as Christians, praying for other Christians around the world who are being persecuted. We need to be familiar with those kinds of things. Know uh, what, uh, what is going on all around the world. Do you know uh, uh, the most dangerous country in the world to be a Christian? You know, there's, uh, there are lists, you know, that are published about the ten most dangerous countries in the world to be, were, uh, to be a Christian. North Korea is al- al- almost always at the top of that list. So, um, so if, you're going to, if you're going to grow and if you're going to be a, a, a lifelong student, 
What that means then is that you are always, always reading. It also means this. It means listen to other people. Listen to other people. Listen to the people in your church. I've learned so much, honestly, from the people in my church. I dare say I've probably learned more from the people in my church for the, than from any other group of people. I, I, I learn about verses when I listen to them pray, and they, they pray and they use certain verses, and I think, oh, I, I don't seem to remember that verse, and I, I, and I almost memorize that verse listening to them pray. You, you learn about Christian marriage from watching uh, solid families in your church. You learn about kindness. Some of the people in my church are so kind, they think of things that I'll never think of in a million years. And, and I learn kindness from them. And so you listen to people. And uh, you go to conferences then. If you're going to learn from other people, you, you go to conferences like this. And if you're a pastor, certainly you want to go to... Um, you want to go to conferences and uh, take modular courses and so on and so forth. Listen to CDs and download sermons and so on and so forth. But when you're at conferences, make sure that you listen to people. Make sure that you really listen. Now maybe, maybe you'll take offense at this, but the fact of the matter is, you know, some people, when they engage in conversation, they're not really listening. You know what it's like, they're, you know, you're talking and, and they're not talking, but you, you can tell they're, they're just ready to jump in. They're not really listening to what you're saying, they're just ready to, as soon as you pause, they're going to say something. They're not really listening. And frankly, some, some young men can be like that. Some young pastors can be like that. They're not interested in learning. They're just interested in saying what they think. Well, you, you know... You want to guard against that. You want to learn from... Uh, old, there are older men you can really learn from, you know. And you want to be, well, James says, quick to listen. Slow to speak, quick to listen. We get that mixed up. We, we turn that around. We're, we're quick to speak and we're very slow to listen. Well, we want to get it right biblically. And, and especially at conferences, we want to listen to what others have to say because in, in all likelihood, they have something to teach us. And so you want to be very, very careful about that. By the same token, older men need to be willing to try and be a blessing to younger men. At a conference such as we're going to have this week, older men who, you know, theoretically we know more, theoretically we're, we're wiser. But we must also be careful not to be jaded, not to be hard and harsh and not to write off young men, but to take an interest in them and to listen to them so that we're able to try and impart some, some wisdom to them as well. And you want that kind of, of mutually beneficial relationship, but it's especially the older teaching the younger. Now, that's the same kind of relationship that Paul expects from older women and younger women. And the older women are to teach the younger women. And in the same way, then, older pastors need to be very careful to take an interest in younger men and try and influence them and try and be a blessing and an encouragement to them. And so, listen to other people. This is all part of being a lifelong student. It's not just a matter of reading books. Not all our teachers are dead. Some of our teachers are right around us, ready to, be, uh, uh, ready to be a blessing to us. And so you want to listen to other people. What's also involved in this is critiquing your own ministry. Uh, critiquing your own ministry. This is being a lifelong student. You, you critique your own ministry. You know, I don't know if I've ever finished a Sunday of ministry and felt that, 
that I'm satisfied with that. You almost always feel, well, that, was, that just wasn't up to par. And that needs to be better. And um, there's always something to critique in our ministry. You never, never, never want to feel as if you've arrived. You know, you've, you've, you've reached the peak. You, every Sunday, you hit one out of the park. You never, need, you never want to start to think like that. At best, you know, we're unprofitable ser servants. Uh, it was Dr. Lloyd-Jones who said something like this. That he's, He said, I've preached twice in my life, and both times I was sleeping. I was dreaming. Well, you know, he, he also said, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't cross the road to hear myself preach. Now, we listen to that, and I've only been privileged to hear him uh, hear recordings of his preaching and I listen to that and I think I've never heard anything like that in my life. And so I can't understand why he would say he wouldn't cross the road. But then you can because that's what humility says. So the fact of the matter is then that when it comes to our own ministry, there's always so much to critique, so much to change, so much to, to learn with regard to preaching better. And so you always want to be careful to, um, to humbly examine your ministry and be willing then to learn and to grow as you see the ways in which you've fallen short. Now, this is all part, as I'm saying, of being a lifelong student. Now, let me close this section with this question. Should you attend ministerials? Should you attend ministerials? Now, my question is that because where I live, most of the ministerials, most of the fraternals are not with reformed men. And so the question is, is it worthwhile? Now, some men would say absolutely worthwhile and others would say absolutely not. My experience, I have rarely attended fraternals that are not reformed. And, um, and yet, I think there are ways in which attending non-reformed fraternals that might be the case in your area uh, could be helpful. You, you learn from others who disagree with you. You learn from those who don't dot your, their eyes the same way you do. You learn from others who really don't read the same books you do. There are also opportunities to teach them humbly and graciously. There are opportunities to befriend them and expose them to good books that otherwise they might not have had exposure to. And so there might be real benefit to, uh, to attending non-reformed fraternals. You might find that not just helpful for yourself, but it might prove to be a blessing for others. In my case, however, I've spent most of my time with uh, brothers of like mind, with reformed uh, Calvinistic Baptist fraternals, and uh, found that to be of great benefit. If if you're able to be a part of that kind of thing, I would strongly, strongly encourage your involvement in that. What I'm finding is that a number of young men in our country are not getting involved in fraternals where they actually meet the way we're meeting today, and they're not meeting on a monthly basis. See, we have, uh, we have a monthly meeting of, of Reformed Baptist pastors and somebody presents a paper, then there's a Q&A, then there's a time of prayer. We do that once a month. And then we finish off the year with a conference like the one that you're going to have this week. But I'm finding that a number of young men are not getting involved in that kind of ministry. And why is that? Well, part of it is because uh, there's so much that's online. There are online activities. 
there are these mega conferences together for the gospel and so on and so forth and that's once a year or once every two years and they go to that and it's it's two thousand people or four thousand people and they're posting it on Facebook and and showing the preacher walk on stage with the applause and all the rest of it and they go to those kinds of things but they don't go to the monthly meetings and I think that that's a sad thing because Frankly, when there's 2,000 men there for three days, they don't know you, and they're not going to be there when you're struggling next week in the ministry. The kind of bond that you build when you meet at a fraternal, that cannot be replaced by that kind of ministry. So that's fine. I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying this is far more useful and far more beneficial. So I'm urging you, if you have the opportunity to be in, involved in that kind of of, of brotherly ministry one to another, take advantage of it. I, I want to urge that upon you as I am presently in these days urging it upon young men in my own country. Um, I think we lose a great deal if we neglect this. And if there's not that kind of thing in your area, well, start something up. Maybe God can use you to... Uh, to initiate some, uh, something along those lines. So, be a lifelong student. That's my second point. Any questions about that? You realize if you don't ask questions, you're going to have to listen to me for another two hours. Just straight. Yes. Oh, was that you? No, nope. brother. There's a microphone somewhere. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Carl, regarding the your second point, how does one avoid being unguided in his uh, study of uh, Reformed theology. Being unguided? Unguided. Because uh, we've heard of uh, the phrase, I don't know whether you've heard of the phrase, the young, the reformed, and the restless, and the uh, neo-reformed, uh, newly reformed um, Christians, but uh, they do it like on a cut and paste basis. They read here and there, and then they come up with like, a, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, Frankenstein reform <laughs> theology. So how does one guide himself in, you know, his uh, self-learning, you know, uh, uh, theology? So if, if I understand your question, how, and we're really talking about someone early in the ministry and early into reform theology. Yes. And how do you make sure that you don't come up with with uh, some kind of distorted theology, but rather something that's whole and well-balanced and um, full-orbed, that kind of thing. Yes, in the context of uh, the person, you know, uh, being a lifelong student. Yeah. So that it's not uh, unguided. Yes. Well, again, I, I think that conferences such as you have here at Kubao, that's really, really helpful. Interaction with men who are balanced, you see, one of the problems when you're not balanced is you run after people who are the same as you and you feed each other. But go and hang out with people who know what they're talking about. I mean, interact with people who are wise and sensible and, and interact with them and listen and uh, ask them what they're reading and, and read those books. So, you know, really, the things that I've been saying is, is be at conferences, uh, fraternals, um, reading the books that solid people recommend. Um, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Yeah. I mean, there's some websites that are supposedly good, theolo that, I mean, supposedly Christian, and they're just horrific. Well, you know, you need, you need guidance. So, again, being with those kinds of men. I think is absolutely vital. Um, the, the providence of God is wonderful too, you know. 
I don't know how many people I know who uh, they've been converted and then or they end up in some weak church and they end up in the providence of God listening to Steve Lawson. How did, how did, they, how did they know about Steve? Well, they just Googled it and then, and then something came up and they listened to Steve and they thought, oh, that's great. And then they keep listening. And then when you listen to Lawson, then you listen to MacArthur. When you listen to MacArthur, well, you know, then it, then it just sort of snowballs after that. And it's the providence of God that leads them to good teaching so that they don't get distorted with Frankenstein theology. So thank God he does that for us. Um, but then, you know, actively look for people who are wise. One of our problems is that we, we tend to look for people who will agree with us, but we need to look for people who are wise. You know? Does that help? Yeah? Okay. Anyone else? Is it, can you get that? <laughs> Sir, what do you mean by, by your statement, quick to listen and slow to speak? Say again. What do you mean by quick to listen and slow to speak? Oh, well, I was just quoting James 1. James 1 says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. And uh, I was saying that we, we tend to get those mixed up. You know, we tend to be uh, very quick to talk, whether we have something to say or not. Um, whereas we should be, you know, quick to listen to people, to hear what that we might learn and, um, and slow to speak. So I was just quoting James 1, okay? All right? Okay, let me, shall I do, um, shall I do one more section and then we can take a break? Because I think there's coffee at the back, yeah? One more, one more section? Okay. All right. Well, th the next section is also very basic. to young pastors also, but, but not just young. So the third thing, I, I said you need to be yourself and then you need to be a lifelong student. And you'll see that these are not in order of, of importance necessarily, but the third one is this, be a Christian. Be a Christian. I, I gather that there are over 400 pastors who are going to be here at the conference this week will not assume that all of them are Christians. I don't assume that all of you are here this morning, this, after, this morning. I don't assume that you're all Christians either. I know of men who've been in the ministry who've not been Christians. We've had members in our church. It's turned out that they were not Christians in the first place. But there have been men in the ministry who have not been Christians. There have been men who have been saved under their own preaching. As they began to preach some proper things, they, they themselves ended up being converted. So the fact of the matter is, you, you need to make sure that you're a Christian. Be a Christian. But more than that, be a growing Christian. Now, here's the important thing for a, a pastor. You must be a growing Christian. Are you a growing Christian? Are you, um, are you benefiting from the means of grace? You yourself. Not just preaching about it, but are you in the Word? Are you reading and praying? Are you experiencing conviction of sin? Are you someone who's pursuing Christ-likeness yourself? It's one of the dangers for, for reformed guys. You know, we're, we reform guys, and we love our books, right? We love, love books, and we love to read, and we love theology, and we love to debate and talk and, and so on and so forth. But are you more Christ-like as a result of it? Are you more like the Lord Jesus? Are you growing in the grace and knowledge 
of the Savior? Are you, are you Enoch-like? Right? What's, what's Enoch famous for? Louder? Walked with God. Imagine that, just in a, few, in a few words. What can I say about Enoch? Oh, he walked with God. So what are they going to say about you? You're a pastor now. What will they say about you? How will they sum you up? What sentence will they give that can summarize your life and your impact? Could they say, well, he walked with God. He grew in the grace and knowledge of Christ regularly. You see, they say that the level of spirituality in the church is not going to go higher than the level of the spirituality of the pastor. So what's your state like? What is your walk like? You see, you need to be really careful, you know. Are you growing? You need to be very careful not to think that you can sin with impunity. You know what I mean by that? You, or you, you start to indulge in sin. You know, it, it may be anything. It may be pornography. It may be an illicit relationship. Uh, all kinds of things. It may be coveting, envy of other people. But you indulge in these kinds of things. And, and you know what? You, you, then you preach on Sunday and it seems to go reasonably well. And you think, well, I mean, you wouldn't put it in these words, but you think to yourself, well, you can kind of still indulge in the sin and still minister and not get caught out. And it doesn't seem to affect the power in the pulpit. Because you, you know, you preach pretty well on Sunday, even though during the week you indulge in some pornography. So you start to think, well, you know, it's not that bad. But what happens is, you know, with some food, you know, you, you say, well, I, I shouldn't have any. Or well, maybe chips, you know, potato chips. And you say, well, I, I shouldn't have any, especially as I get older, I don't, I can't eat potato chips too much because it gets, starts to show up too much. So you say, well, I'll just have one. And once you have one, what happens? Well, then it's two. Then, it's, then the bag's gone, right? It's the way it is with sin. And eventually, it becomes evident. What's more, when you indulge in sin and there's unconfessed sin in your life, you grieve the Spirit and you quench the Spirit. And so, a pastor must not think that he can sin with impunity. No, he needs to be dealing with sin, convicted of it, confessing it, forsaking it, growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's to be a Christian who is a growing Christian, a Christian who's in the Word, a Christian who's reading the Scriptures, let me ask you are, you, are you reading through the Bible? Do you read through the Bible in a year? At least once a year. You know, you, you know, there are all kinds of programs out there that you can use that will take you through the Bible in a year. I won't ask, but, you know, I could ask, put up your hand if you've read through the Bible this last year. In 2019, did you read through the Bible? How many of you are reading through the Bible this year? And if there's anything I'd say to young men who are in the ministry, it's read, 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 and read your Bible. You need to be intimately familiar with the Scriptures. You need to have the Bible and the verses of the Bible at your fingertips, on the tip of your tongue, just ready to use that sword. Verses coming to mind. One of the great things about the Puritans when you read them is that they, they're just quoting verses from all over. And I think, I don't even know where that verse was from. Like, they're just amazing. So, you know, read your Bible. 
I'd love to ask you, how many, how many chapters of the Bible have you read this last week? See, that's more important. It's more important to read the Bible than it is to come to a conference. So, read your Bible and, and spend time in prayer. That's more important than conferences and fraternals. I mean, if, if I asked you how many, ver how many chapters of the Bible you read this last week, how many, how many minutes have you spent in prayer? And then, so we're talking here then about, about a pastor who, well, he's a Christian and he's a growing Christian. He's a Christian and he's walking with God. He's a Christian, he loves the Word, and he's at the throne of grace. And then let me add this. If he's a, a Christian pastor who's a, who's a husband and a father, not only is he having his own devotions, but he's having family devotions. He's having family devotions. What I mean by family devotions, and in case you've not thought about it, gather your little family around and you, you do Bible study and you teach the little ones and you pray with them. We used to, we used to lie on the floor. You know, I'd gather the kids. My wife and I would lie on the ground on the, and then we'd open the Bible and my kids would climb on my back. You know, one of them would climb on my back while I'm lying down and... One would sit here, and then we'd read through, and, and, uh, and then we'd sing a hymn. Thankfully, my wife could sing. I can't sing to save my life. So she could sing, and, and then the kids would sing too. And, and then we'd ask them questions. You know, if there's a passage of the Bible, you, you know, what was the man's name? His name was Nicodemus, you know. And, and what did Jesus say he had to do? He had to be born again. And what does it mean to be born again? And then it gets quiet. One time I asked my little girl, um, you know, we were looking at John, and Jesus says that truth shall make you free. And um, I said, what does it mean to be free? She says, I'm free, and I'm going to be four. <laughs> so I said, well, let's, let's work on that. Let me explain that a little more. But so my question to you then is, are you doing that? Are you doing family devotions? Because you have to watch over your own family. You have to care for your own household if you're going to care for the household of God. Right? And you as a husband, this is your job. It's not your wife's job. You're the man of the house. You're the, you're the head of the home. God has made you head of the home. The question is only whether you're going to fulfill that responsibility well or not. So, so this is your job, and so are you going to fulfill this responsibility? And as I say, there, there's a connection there that Paul makes, and he says, if you're going to lead the house of God, if you're going to watch over that house, you need to be watching over the house of uh, your own house, your own family, right? So you're a, you're a pastor who's a Christian, that's the thing, and a growing Christian, and, and a growing Christian then who's who's drawing in all the members of his immediate family so that they can grow together. He can teach them the Word so that the little ones can come to know Christ and grow in the grace and knowledge of their Savior.